Hey, what's up, squad? From Root Suite, I'm Colin Smith, and you are listening to the Cold Ones Podcast. It's a podcast with chilly questions and even colder ice cream. And today, we're joined by my friend Keith Rabkin. You know him as a CRO at PandaDoc. Love the platform, by the way. Former SVP at Security Scorecard and your favorite Wharton Finance Club president. Welcome to the show, Keith. Hey, thanks for having me, Colin. I'm really excited to be here today. Yeah, me too, man. I, and by the way, I love PandaDoc. I just want to like say that up front. Uh, you didn't pay me to say that. I love PandaDoc, though, man. I use it every single day. I love that. Yeah, we we have a ton of really avid, passionate fans who love what we do, and it's so great for the sales use case. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sell hard on the show today, <laughs> but I'm really glad to hear that. And I always love talking to customers who are seeing value in the product we have. No doubt, no doubt. Well, welcome to Cold Ones, man. We're, again, we're we're grateful to have you. We're excited to have you. Um, you know, kind of dive in a little bit. As you know, we always pick. We curate two ice creams for our guests uh, based on our conversations, based on just getting to know you and, and uh, becoming a friend. And so for the first one, before we jump into our personal rapid fire, do you have the ice cream ready? I do. I'm going to eat it right out of the carton. At first, I was a little, I was a little like offended maybe that you were giving me vanilla, <laughs> old, old fashioned vanilla. I know you have a reason that you picked this, which I can't wait to hear, but yeah, I was yeah. like, are you saying something about me? Are you calling me <laughs> it's vanilla? It's plan, old Keith. No, no. In, our, in our, one of our first conversations, you and I bonded over how old fashioned the pharma and med device industry is. Few people know this, but you have a background in Johnson Johnson. I have a background in applied medical and, and some other great companies. And they're awesome, right? But they are so old fashioned compared to where we are now. And so I thought it was fitting for a, for a personal rapid fire. Yeah, we had a good bonding about that. Um, <laughs> and while I certainly loved my time in J&J, it was very old fashioned, it was hard to get them to change. And it is great being back in the tech world in a place yeah. that's fast moving. And as we'll talk about, very customer centric. Yeah. Um, which you don't often find in the, the healthcare world. Yeah, it's a little different, right? Some different folks, you know, it works for them though. And they're successful. Um, all right, you ready for some rapid fire? Yeah. All right, first question. And, and, and I also like to say, I love this part of the conversation. I know we kind of like jumped through it, but I love this part of the conversation because people know Keith as a CRO of PandaDoc, right? They see you on LinkedIn and they know your picture on the LinkedIn, but they might not know who is Keith Rabkin. And I think it's really, um, yeah, it's, it's really enlightening to get to know some folks deeper than just the LinkedIn post. So first thing, Keith, what is something um, what is something about you that people often misinterpret? Well, I was going to make a little joke about the vanilla. Um, I think some people might often say that I could be a little vanilla. Like I've been described as, as very nice, like very nice guy, like very like what you see is what you get. You made the joke about my flannel, like yeah, I wear flannels a lot. Um, I think I'm this like, I don't think I'm vanilla like if i probably had to describe myself i may be like a mint chip honestly i'm this like very weird mix of like super nice like you're never going to find someone who is nicer but also this incredible driver who i think sometimes just like pushes people really hard well let me ask you i think as someone who has been described as intense i've definitely been described as intense and my dad's very intense i know exactly where i get it my mom's pretty intense have you always been able to turn it on and off or did was the intensity something you had to learn later in your in your career later in your life as you evolved I think it's always been there, but I think there's like, there's a couple of defining moments in my career and each of those defining moments has sort of made the intensity come out. Um, so the first was when I went to business school and in business school, I like really set out to, to work really hard and, um, do very well, take advantage of everything going back to school provided, right? Like it's, yeah. it's so great being in college the first time and then you go into the working world. And then I was like, oh my God, I had this missed opportunity. I didn't take advantage of everything college had to offer. So let me make sure I do it. And so like that ratcheted up the intensity. And then the second time was joining Google where it was just this amazing company and there was so much to take advantage of. And I made sure I doubled down my effort. And then, you know, I think beyond that, it's just continued to come out of these like inflection points in my career. Yeah, okay. So it's something that kind of, you evolved into as, as you, as you grew up, maybe, maybe, or as you got, you know, older and, and, and um, deeper in your career. I think for me, I've had to evolve in the other direction. I think I was really intense. And I think if you talk to like people I went to school with, I think sometimes arrogant could have been a word that was described. And, and I don't like that. And it's something that I've worked really hard to go in the other direction, become more of the mellow, relaxed, kind soul. Um, so, so we've kind of both crossed the chasm, not, not in the area way, but um, in uh, evolving. All right. Um, I love this question so much. What is, something that few people know about Keith, but you wish more folks did. So it's interesting. I was um, thinking about this. I feel like I'm kind of an open book, really. I don't really try to put on something that's different than who I am. I don't have a different work persona from my personal. I, I feel like the teams I work with get to know me really well. Yeah. 
So that was a little bit of a hard question. Um, and I'm not sure there's anything I wish people knew about me, I guess, but maybe some things that don't make it out in my day job or in my normal life, even with, with people who are friends. Uh, my passion for gardening, like I absolutely love going in the garden. So I live in California, Northern California. We've got a great climate and, you know, I never would have guessed this about myself, but when we got a house, I would like, I just found myself gravitating towards planting things and making sure like the garden was well put together. And then I started collecting fruit trees and uh, we got like a ton of citrus this year, which was great. Um, I've got my pomegranate trees now starting to bear fruit. My avocado trees bearing fruit. I get like really pumped when I see it. Yeah. And you see even getting lit up right now. Oh yeah. oh yeah, for sure. And then I took that a step further and I got like a gardening box and I've been growing my own kale and strawberries and carrots. So oh, man. that's, that's something a lot of people don't know. And then I alluded to like, I can be a bit of a workaholic. Um, but I think also just, I love spending time with my family. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so like I work hard and it's so cliche, but I play hard and like really try to play hard your garden. <laughs> yes. I, I imagine gardening is, I mean, literally grounding, like literally grounding, right? And with um, being a CRO, especially with fast growing organization like Pandoc, like you're, you're, you're in the Excels, you're in the CRM, you're spending so much time. It's like, I remind you of like the um, uh, Wolf of Wall Street, er, 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 ee, 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 like numbers, 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 get outside, put the phone away, spend some time in the dirt. Like that seems like the polar opposite brings you back. Yeah, I think that's spot on. I mean, it really, it takes you back to like, where humans came from and um there's just like something really refreshing about i mean you could say it's not nature because it's like my backyard but it's yeah. like it natural is. elements and you know like you're you're there with like the pollinators the bugs the worms like your hands are dirty um it's great i mean it just I've never garden maybe they'd like that maybe i should try it this year huh all right keith you inspired me all right i'm gonna do the last one last one do you want to do heist funniest uh um celebrity encounter or do you want to do last purchase over 250? Which do you prefer? I, I don't have a, like a great funniest celebrity encounter. I'll just say quickly, I went to a high school with a lot of celebrities. Um, so that was, it was just interesting because like they weren't celebrities at the time. They yeah. were children of celebrities. Um, uh, I won't go into that, so we'll just leave it there. Okay. Um, so why don't you ask the other question? But that's like okay. a- um, last, last purchase over 250 bucks. Anything so I would, I would say, yeah, like dinners, very frequent. Like I'm a very big foodie. So I love dinners over 250. I'm also a big wine person, but I do not spend over 250. Yeah, wine. come on. Um, so I brought I bought a new soft shell jacket and Arcteryx. Um, that's probably my recent. Purchase. Was it the Atom? You know, I don't think it's the Atom. I think it's like a the Gamma MX. Okay. okay, that's pretty funny, man. One of our uh, we we recently did um, a cold ones with with another great uh, great. I'll leave the name off and it'll come out. But marketing leader, and we asked the question, and he said um, an Arcteryx jacket called the Atom, which was his favorite jacket he's ever had. So we've got some Arcteryx fans in the in this uh, SaaS space here. Yeah, they make some great stuff. Yeah, no doubt, man. No doubt. I've never I've never owned a Arcteryx jacket, uh, but I like the logo. I like the logo. It's kind of fun. All right, Keith, thank you for sharing a little bit, man. Thanks for opening up, being vulnerable with us. We're going to transition to the second part. And this is really the operating wisdom, right? Like you've done so much, again, from J&J to Google to Security Scorecard and now leading uh, the entire revenue division at, at um, Pandadoc. I'm excited to dive into some of the topics we have at hand here. So bring up that second ice cream. Do you have it with you? Boom. It's the blue one. You go, go for it. That's even a silly, it's just a silly carton right there. I don't think I've ever heard of this brand before. Maybe I'm like missing out. But. I don't think I've ever heard of it nor ordered it, but it's the twist. It's the strawberry cream twist. And the reason I got this is because a big part of our conversation, how are we doing? Really sweet. Yeah, it looks like- Super sweet. It looks like, uh, like 1990 um, summer at the pool ice cream that you get from like, the pool stand it's exactly what it tastes like <laughs> yeah exactly um the twist man I, I saw it and i was like i'm really like we have not on the cold ones to date talked about consumer technology and that's a big part of our conversation today which is a total twist on b2b SaaS, and I, I mean just everything seems to be different and i'm so pumped about that so that's why we picked the twist the strawberry and cream for you um all right you ready to jump in yeah let's do it so, so first one's one that I personally, I personally asked you to talk about, and it's operating in a highly competitive space. I think a lot of folks are afraid of operating in a highly competitive space. I'm afraid of it. It just seems challenging, right? And I think, I think document management would be considered, you know, a, a competitive space and certainly one where there are vendors that, I, that come to mind for me and some I've used, some I haven't. So I want to just kind of ask you, Keith, first and foremost, share a little bit of insight on operating in, in a highly competitive space. And let's dive into some of the tactics and some of the playbooks that you've learned to, to deploy uh, to win. 
Yeah. Um, thanks for teeing that up. I think, you know, I've talked about this with you and with others in the past, but your reason for bringing up consumer tech, consumer tech, I find, and I learned this in my days at Google, my days at Adobe, that you anchor on what the customer needs and you try to solve for that. And I think oftentimes in B2B SaaS, number one, we forget that you're trying to solve a customer need. We're just selling to you from a process. And you also forget that your buyers are consumers in their home life. And so what I try to do is really think about how I can anchor back to that customer need. And I think in a particularly competitive space, this leads to some different angles. Um, for me, it means that I go even deeper on the customer needs in the very beginning. Like I want to, I want, like, I don't want to bring the competition up. I don't want to go head to head against the competition. I want to leave breadcrumbs in my discovery in particular and my sales process that get the people I'm talking to, to understand why my platform is a better choice for them. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that keeps me from going down that hard path cell. Um, now, how do you do that? I think you do like the classic sales techniques. It's, you know, it's mirroring, it's going deep on discovering, um, and that will lead to answers. So one really interesting thing, yesterday I was on a pretty large potential deal for PandaDoc and they're with the incumbent today. Um, and I just started, you know, classic, like, just tell me about your business and what's working and how does, like, how does this process work for your customers? And I was trying to get to their customers and understand their customer pain yeah. points that leads to their pain points in selling to customers. Yeah. And eventually through these open-ended questions and mirroring, I got to find out that the incumbent is not letting them white label part of the service. Mm. And I didn't have to, I didn't have to say that that's a strength. I didn't talk about the extra margin they can make by reselling us. Um, they brought it up and then I like, I pounce on it. I think that's also a really like a kind of a difference is yeah. in less of a competitive situation. I tend to do all the discovery, yeah. get everything on the table and then move into sell mode. Whereas here, like when you've got that vein, I try to dive right in and yeah. like really create a separation so that they start associating my company, in this case, PandaDoc, with what is different from what the incumbent can provide. Right. So when you talk about, you know, dropping breadcrumbs, like I, I've heard of it described as breadcrumbs, I've heard it described as like landmines, like you're laying landmines that the competition is going to step on later. Um, how, like, what does that look like? How does one coach to that? Like, is it really the process that I would think of and that I've, that I've used in the past is what are our key advantages and how do you back into kind of like planting those in the conversations? Like share a little bit more about that tactically. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Like know your advantage, know where you're stronger than the competition Yeah, so that you can guide there. You can ask leading questions that get them to open that up. And I think that's really one of the most important things is knowing where you're strong and knowing where you're weak. I think that's the other piece that I always try to do in competitive is um, acknowledge that you're weak. Like I really believe in being authentic and honest with my customers. And so if I'm head to head against maybe a larger company in the document space, like what do they have that we don't have? And I'll put that on the table and then I try to like knock it down, right? You know, you like, um, it's like a layup, like you're serving yourself a layup and you just like, or serving them a layup and letting them yeah. knock it down. It's like, yeah. yeah, we can't match that size and scale. We're not that big, but do you really care about that? Do you right. need ISO 9,000? Like, do you need all these certifications for your business? Probably not. Right. What do you really care about? And then you yeah. like get them to tell you that. And then you're like, that's where we differentiate. Right, right, right. One one more question on this. There's, I think there's some competing, oh, pun intended, uh, philosophies on operating in competitive space. You have the Jeff Bezos, which is completely ignore competition, focus 100% on the customer and don't even like avoid the competition, everything about them at all costs. And then there's the, you know, kind of the maybe more fear mongering, uh, paranoid, you know, founder that's like focus at, at the competitors, every move. Like, how do you balance that? When do you focus on the competition and when do you completely ignore them? And maybe you're like, no, nah, I'm on the Bezos side. I don't pay any attention to them. I'm more on the Bezos side. It's, it's what does the customer need? The place where the competition comes in is if you're thinking about what the customer needs and but there's always going to be a lot that they need and you have to build with, with your team towards that over time. If there's things that the competition is doing that meet those needs better than you, you've got to understand that, yeah. right? It's not so much you're going after what the competition does. You're going after what the customer does but the competitor may do it better than you do today. Right. And understanding that is useful to make sure that you can address the things the customer cares about. And like I said, if the competition is a better fit for the customer, give the goodwill and push the customer towards the competition because when you're ready later, you will have earned the trust that right. then allows them to make the switch. Right, right. That's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it takes, um, 
a lot of confidence and maybe some some war scars of of focusing too much on the competition seeing it not really work out in your favor for you to go it's not the right approach um so keith you said something to me in our in one of our first conversations that really struck me and i'm still trying to make sense of it and i don't i don't know i don't know if i, I still to this day understand it but that's why i want to dive into it you said colin you have to treat the sales process like a customer experience you have to I don't know. Tell me what you, what you shared. It was so like, what does that even mean? But it sounds great. Yeah. So I do like to think of the customer experience and, and in fact, the whole customer journey, not just sales, right? Yeah. Everything from whether it's an outbound, that cold call, that experience to get them into the funnel or an inbound, that process has to be a customer experience too, because your customer is going through a process to buy something, right? Like if you go into the market, you know, are the goods laid out in a nice way that's easy to find what you need, right? That could be equivalent to like, how is, are things merchandise on your website? Right. Then you go to the checkout line, right? And, you know, is it a long checkout line? Are the registers open? Yes or no? Yeah. Um, that's similar to your funnel. Like how easy is it to get in touch with a salesperson? Mm -hmm. And then you're in the buying process. Like how nice is the cashier? Is it, do they scan your goods really fast? It's the same thing with, let's just refine it to the sales experience here. Right. When I start talking to a salesperson, are they friendly? Do they greet me? Do they make it easy to understand my needs? Do they have a good follow-up over the buying cycle? Um, you know, how hard is it to execute the contract? How hard is it to understand the numbers, right? When sometimes you see B2B SaaS companies that completely obfuscate the numbers where there's so overages, bad. right? Yeah. Like, oh yeah, so it looks really good from year one, as long as you're under this volume. But the moment you cross this volume, there's all kinds of hidden fees and stuff. Right. Try to make it a really transparent and easy to understand experience because I think customers enjoy that. And the more you optimize that and you make it an enjoyable buying experience, the more likely they are to buy your product, the more likely they are to refer you to their friends, and the more likely they are to stay with your company. Right, right. Taking all the stuff that has been really hot in the CX world and actually bring it into the sales and buying process. That That's exact. So it was, it was I remember the, the, the direct quote is like, you know, Colin, you have to think about your sales process as a product. That was what we talked about. And I was like, I, product, like, I don't know why I went hardware, like iPhone and then sales process, this like philosophical kind of like airy, right? Just, it's not, you can't touch and feel it. Um, can you give an example though? Of like the, the last thing you just said was think about all of the CX tools and, and, and research and innovation that you've seen over a consumer and bring it into the sales process. Can you share an example? Can you, can we get tactical here and drill into where did you, when you showed up, let's say Panda Doc, you know, month one. What was an, or it doesn't have to be that example, but what's an example of a place where you're like, we need to optimize this portion of the process. I'll tell you one I actually don't like. Um, I'll use the, uh, the opposite one that like I'm caught, right? I'm caught because yeah. I want to make sure <laughs> that, um, you know, I'm running a healthy sales cycle, but I also want to make sure I'm customer centric. And it's, if you're in that discovery call and like every good salesperson knows you don't want to talk price right away. Um, you don't want to like, you definitely don't want to get in the nitty gritty. You might like talk about it at a high level, but, um, and I do this when I'm on sales calls too. Like I go the first thing, I'm like, I want to know the price. Yeah. And all of these reps are like, nope, we're not going to tell you the price. And I'm like, I'm out of here. Like, this is not interesting to me anymore. Cause you just destroyed my customer experience. Like yeah. I don't want to spend my time in a discussion where price is an obstacle. Like, and I get yeah. it. You want to go to value first. Um, so if my customers, a Panda doc want to get to price, my reps will talk about price early. Now we try not to, we, we really want to do that deep discovery. We want to make sure that we understand their needs and then we're guiding them away from price because yeah. we want it to be about value. Right. Um, but at the end of the day, you've got to make it work in a way that it does for the customer. And if the customer right. is in a rush or they're in a competitive cycle, you got to be willing to do that. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, if we're talking about like consumer technology, right? could you imagine going to a grocery store and picking up a steak and it didn't have the price on it only to show up at the register and find out it's $200 and you had a $50 budget for a New York trip? Or like, have you ever been to a restaurant and it's like market price for the lobster? Uh, yeah, yeah. You're like, oh, I definitely want lobster tonight. Market. And you're like, heart set on that lobster. And then the waiter comes and you're like, I mean, I don't know, maybe people order it without asking what the market price is, but I always yeah. ask. Yeah. And then like, oh, it's like $80 for the lobster. And I'm like, yep, guess I'm going to my second choice. And yeah. now I'm disappointed because yeah. I have got my heart set on it. You got here and then you went down, right? You got here and you went down. Um, Let's say we have a lot of CROs and VPs of sales who listen to this, uh, to cold ones. And, and I, I imagine there's gonna be some folks who hear this and go, okay, make our sales process, think of it as a product. I like that. I know we need to improve our sales process. We've been told, I can think of some 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 customers and and uh, some some advisors who have shared with me confidentially. We've been told we're really hard to work with and we need to improve that. So they're listening to this and they go, Keith, help me. Like, how can I, how can I? What are so some- I'll tell, you, 
Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you one of the best things we did. Um, we took someone on our team, um, someone in marketing, and we made them do a secret shopper on us. And they like created a fake company and they went through our sales process and they recorded all the calls and they broke it down and they told us everything that didn't work. It was like, look, first thing, took you guys way too long to get back to us on the inbound funnel. Second thing, rep showed up, you know, saw I was sort of like younger, maybe not like the perfect buyer. They didn't treat me with respect. Mm -hmm. Those got cleaned up real fast, right? Like the moment we found out this was happening, you can like, there's things that just don't, you you can't check everything. And the moment you understand these things, you can go out and fix them. Or another thing, um, the follow-up time was too long between calls. You're, you know, nobody shared the information in a way I could understand. And you start to break these things down and you create like a punch list of all the things you've got to go and fix. Uh, So that secret shopper exercise was really powerful for us. That's interesting. I don't think I've heard of an organization doing that. That's really, and how long into your time at PandaDoc did you deploy the secret shopper strategy? We did it in the first month. Um, This was something I had seen at other companies. And I just, like I, like I say, I really obsess about the customer journey. And this is a very important part of the customer journey, making sure we nail that customer experience in the selling process has led to better outcomes. And we hypothesized it would, and this got us an unbiased look. Cause right. Like if you're honest, you go join a sales call as the CRO, everyone's going to be on their best behavior. And you're like, great. My sales seems super professional. They're going to do it. Um, you know, this gives you that like behind the scenes look to go make things better. And and did they ever get like I just want to, did they ever get caught like did the seller ever like kind of pick up like I think this is someone that works for me or no like they like pulled the whole thing off. We I think we went out we did twenty calls and one seller figured it out. Oh, that must have been kind of awkward. Also, <laughs> that's great. Yeah, it was it was awkward. Uh, the team did a really good job on it, um, but it's been it's been really powerful. And you know I think like and I think it's the other thing right, which maybe goes back to my like being vanilla and yeah. being a nice guy is like it's all good. We're here to fix things. We're here to make things better. It's not like the reps who who didn't do things right. You know, yeah. it, it was just like, great. This isn't what the standard we want to be is. So let's yeah. move in that direction. And, you know, hats off to my team because they really have embraced all the change yeah. and up-leveled their game in a tremendous way. Was there any that you felt like was welcomed with open arms versus maybe an optimization that was really pushed against and you had to, you had to change and manage that harder than those? I think change is really, really hard, um, but the proof is in the pudding. When you get win rates up, when you get deal sizes up, um, that is the answer, right? And like, I try to, you know, and it's hard, I think, especially when you're new, because you can't say, trust me. Yeah. But um, I think sometimes starting small, which can be a really good tactic is like, yeah. start with one rep or two reps or start with a pod of reps and get them to do it and show that that success works. And sometimes you've got people who are inherently more open to trying new things, win them over and then use those allies to win, win over the rest of the sales team. That can work yeah. really well. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, have you read the book, uh, Switch? No, I don't think I have. Great. Here, let me, uh, I'll send you a link and uh, right. I can send it to you as well. It's a great book. It's by... Um, Chip and Dan Heath, and it's all about change management. They talk about the elephant, the rider, and the path. The three things you need to address to really uh, move the needle, uh, organize change, and execute on it. And, and you're talking about, I think, really the the elephant, which is the emotions. It is showing the president's club, right? A doctor is doing it, and they're whooping your ass on the weekly calls. And so if they're doing it, you should probably consider, right? Yeah. All right, Keith. Um, I want to wrap things up. So, Keith, uh, I appreciate you making the time, man. You escaped without a brain freeze. Uh, you did the cold ones episode. You got some ice cream. We got both of them. We got the ice cream uh, from the pool in 1992. And then we've got the beautiful old fashioned vanilla. Um, yeah, I would, I would recommend the Tillamook. I wasn't, I wasn't sure, but it is like, it's very good. It's, you know, there very we go. Good. good. We became, we, we're, we're going to start getting sponsors from ice creams, man. It's going to be like a NASCAR. It's going to be like, just, 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 we're going to have it all over. Um, so Keith, tell the audience, man, the folks who are listening, what's going on in your neck of the woods next year? What are you excited about? And uh, what can we, what can we expect from you? Yeah, so PandaDoc has a huge Q2 lined up, and I think my product marketing team will will kill me if I if I spill things. But um, if you don't know about PandaDoc, just follow us on LinkedIn. It's very low pressure. Um, we're a great sales tool, specifically for proposals and quotes. Uh, we do play an e-signature, but it's really about making sellers' life easy. And the things that are coming in Q2 will absolutely help with that. Um, there's going to be some very big announcements, one in every month of Q2, all leading up to a fairly big partnership that we're excited about. And uh, it's going to help many sellers spend less time checking for errors, spending less time copying and pasting information between systems. And 
one of the great things is we will help you win more deals. So that's, yeah. that's what I'm here for. And, you know, like I said, we treat this like a consumer product. We want to make it easier for you to do the things you want. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited. Well, you're keeping us on the edge of the seat, man. You're dangling the carrot in front of us. I mean, they, you're the product marketing the team where they like, they're yeah. pretty strict here. You no, know, it's good. I want to get my hands off. Well, I, I'm going to be, fall, I, I think I already do fall pandemic, but if I, if, if, if those who are listening, don't check it out because we got some uh, May, June, July announcements coming out. Yeah. It's, there's good stuff for everybody in there. All right. Well, thank you for your time, Keith. I appreciate you, brother. Yeah. Thanks, Colin. Thank you.